I'll tell you a little bit about the irrational behavior, not yours, of course, other people's. Uh, so um, after being at MIT for, uh, for a few years, I realized that uh, writing academic uh, papers is not uh, that exciting. You know, I don't know how many of those you read, but it's not fun to read and often not fun to write, even worse to write. So I decided to try and write something uh, more fun. And I uh, came up with an idea that I will write a cookbook. And the title for my cookbook was going to be Dining Without Crumbs, The Art of Eating Over the Sink. <laughs> and it was going to be a look at life through the kitchen. And I was quite excited about this. I was going to talk about a little bit about research, a little bit about the kitchen. You know, we do so much in the kitchen, I thought this would be interesting. And I wrote a couple of chapters, and I took it to MIT Press, and they said, uh, you know, cute, but not for us. Go and find somebody else. I tried other people, and everybody said the same thing, uh, cute, not for us. Um, until somebody said, um, look, uh, if you're serious about this, you first have to write a book about your research. You have to publish something, and then you'll get the opportunity to write something else. If you really want to do it, you have to do it. So I said, you know, I really don't want to write about my research. I do this all day long. I want to write something else, something a bit more free, less constrained. And this uh, person was very um, forceful and said, look, that's the only way you'll ever do it. So I said, okay, if I have to do it, I had a sabbatical, I said I'll write about my research if there's no other way, and then I'll get to do my cookbook. So I wrote a, a book on my research, and it turns out to be quite fun in two ways. First of all, I enjoyed writing, but the more interesting thing was that I stopped learning from people. It's a fantastic time to write because there's so much feedback you can get from people. People write me about their personal experience and about their examples and what they disagree and nuances. And even being here, I mean, the last few days, I've, I've known really heights of uh, obsessive behavior I never uh, thought about, <coughs> which I think is just fascinating. I want to tell you a little bit about irrational behavior, and I want to start by giving you some examples of visual illusion as a metaphor for rationality. So think about these two tables, and you must have seen this illusion. If I ask you what's longer, the vertical line on the table on the left, or the horizontal line on the table on the right, which one seems longer? Can anybody see anything but the left one being longer? No, right? It's impossible. Uh, but the nice thing about visual illusion is we can easily demonstrate mistakes. So I can put some lines on, doesn't help. I can animate the lines, and to the extent you believe me, I didn't shrink the lines, which I didn't. I've proven to you that your eyes were deceiving you. Now, the interesting thing about this is when I take the lines away, it's as if you haven't learned anything in the last minute. You can't, <laughs> you can't look at this and say, okay, now I see reality as it is, right? It's impossible to overcome this sense that this is indeed longer. Our intuition is really fooling us in a repeatable, predictable, consistent way. There's almost nothing we can do about it aside from taking a ruler and starting to measure it. Here's another one. This is one of my favorite illusions. What do you see the color that the top arrow is pointing to? Brown. The brown, thank you. The bottom one? Yellow. yellow. Turns out they're identical. Can anybody see them as identical? Very, very hard. I can cover the rest of the cube up, and if I cover the rest of the cube, you can see that they're identical. And if you don't believe me, you can get the slide later and do some arts and crafts and see that they're identical. <laughs> But again, it's the same story, that if we take the background away, the illusion comes back, right? There's no way for us not to see this illusion. I guess uh, maybe if you're colorblind, I don't think you can see that. I want you to think about illusion as a metaphor. You know, vision is one of the best things we do. We have a huge part of our brain dedicated to vision, bigger than dedicated to anything else. We do more vision, more hours of the day than we do anything else. And we're evolutionary designed to do vision. And if we have these predictable, repeatable mistakes in vision, in which we're so good at, what's the chance that we don't make even more mistakes in something we're not as good at? For example, financial decision making. Um, <laughs> something we don't have an evolutionary reason to do, we don't have a specialized part of the brain, and we don't do that many hours of the day. And the, and the argument is that on those cases, it might be the issue that we actually make many more mistakes. And worse, not have an easy way to see them. Because in visual illusions, we could easily demonstrate the mistakes. In cognitive illusion, it's much, much harder to demonstrate to people the mistakes. So I want to show you some cognitive illusion, uh, or decision-making illusion in the, same, in the same way. 
Um, this is uh, one of my favorite plots in social sciences. It's, it's from uh, a paper by Johnson and Goldstein. And it basically shows the percentage of people who indicate that they would be interested in giving their organs to donation. And these are different countries in Europe, and you basically see two types of countries. Countries on the right, that seems to be giving a lot, and countries on the left, that seems to be giving very little, or you know, much less. The question is why? Why do some countries give a lot and some countries give a little? When you ask people this question, they usually think that it has to be something about culture. Right? How much do you care about people? Giving your organs to somebody else is probably about how much you care about society, how linked you are. Or maybe it is about religion. But if you look at this plot, you could see that countries that we think about as very similar actually exhibit very different behavior. For example, Sweden is all the way on the right, and Denmark, that we think is culturally very similar, is all the way on the left. Germany is on the left, and Austria is on the right. The Netherlands is on the left, and Belgium is on the right. And, and finally, depending on your particular version of uh, European similarity, you can think about the UK and France as either similar culturally or not. <coughs> but it turns out that uh, from organ donation, they're very different. By the way, the Netherlands is an interesting story. You see, the Netherlands is kind of the biggest of the small group. <coughs> um, turns out that they got to 28% after mailing every household in the country a letter begging people to join this organ donation program. Right, so you know the expression, begging only gets you so far? It's 28% in organ donation. <laughs> <laughs> but whatever the countries on the right are doing, they're doing a much better job than begging. So what are they doing? Turns out the secret has to do with the form at the DMV. And here's the story. The countries on the left have a form at the DMV that looks something like this. Check the box below if you want to participate in the organ donor program. And what happens? People don't check and they don't join. The countries on the right, the ones that give a lot, have a slightly different form. It says check the box below if you don't want to participate. <laughs> Interestingly enough, when people get this, they again don't check, but now they join <laughs> the program. Now, think about what this means. You know, we, we wake up in the morning and we feel we make decisions. We wake up in the morning and we open the closet and we feel that we decide what to wear. And we open the refrigerator and we feel that we decide what to eat. And what this is actually saying is that much of these decisions are not residing within us. They're residing by the person who's designing that form. When you walk into the DMV, the person who designed the form will have a huge influence on what you'll end up doing. Now, it's also very hard to intuit these results. Think about it for yourself. How many of you believe that if you went to renew your license tomorrow, and you went to the DMV, and you would encounter one of these forms, that would actually change your own behavior? Very, very hard to think that it would influence us, right? We can say, oh, these funny Europeans, of course it would influence them. But when it comes to us... <laughs> We have such a feeling that we're in the driver's seat. We have such a feeling that we're in control and we are making the decision that it's very hard to even accept the idea that we actually have an illusion of making a decision rather than actual decision. Now, you might say, you know, these are decisions we don't care about. In fact, by definition, these are decisions about something that will happen to us after we die. How could we care about something less than something that happens after we die? So a standard economist, somebody who believes in rationality, would say, you know what? The cost of lifting the pencil and marking a V is higher than the possible benefit of the decision, so that's why we get this effect. But in fact, it's not because it's easy, it's not because